guys have been doing that for years. That was just marvelous. Thank you so much for all the work and all the thought and all the care and all the intention and all the beauty and yes. This is my 23rd Easter service. And approximately equally split between two forms of Unitarian Universalism. Now, one form is that associated with the Unitarian Universalist Association. And in that world, most of the interest is in what in the traditional churches is called the social gospel. The teachings that Jesus and other marvelous spiritual teachers have given us about how we can live together more effectively, more wonderfully on this planet, relating to the planet more beautifully. It's fabulous. The other branch of Unitarian Universalism that I participate in is often called New Thought. And the emphasis in that branch which is equally derived from the work of Ralph Waldo Emerson, is on the miracles, on the incredible things that happened around this person that we call Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the Nazarene, and happened among all the prophets in the Older Testament, and happened among the apostles in the epistles. Isn't that interesting? Apostles, epistles. <laughs> For me, these are equally valid, important, relevant aspects of being. And I'm proud that they share a single theology. Unitarian, there is one. And we are that one. All is one. And universalist all participate, not only in the one, but we will never be, have never been separated from the one. All beingness included. It's marvelous. And the other piece of the theology that we share is that this guy that we call Jesus Christ was not someone super special, but was a human being who achieved the full capacities that humanity is capable of. And so my work for the last 23 years has been to find what it is that we are capable of and how we can learn to be and do and become that. And that's what I'm here to do. And today is an interesting day. Easter, when I'm in the humanist version of Unitarian Universalism, we look at these beautiful flowers and we say, this is the renewal of life. Every winter beneath the bitter snows are those seeds, are those bulbs, are those tender roots that are ready to emerge into becoming beautiful, beautiful blossoms. And even in the winters of our heart, there is something ready to emerge and blossom. And then when I'm in the new thought, branch of Unitarian Universalism, we focus on something entirely different. <laughs> I will often introduce a flower communion because as we go through this process, something happens that's beautiful and magical. But what we are focusing on is how that power of life is us, each and every one of us. We are not separated from life. It is not something that somehow comes from somewhere else and flows through us or enlivens us when we ask it to. But we are it. And that power that we call life is also called love. And when we embody that love, incredible things happen. Amazing things happen. And yesterday, we did a little workshop which laid out some of the principles of that. There are 12 principles. That's why there are 12 apostles, by the way. And there are 12 numbers, basic numbers, in the numerological framework. And there are 12 walls to the New Jerusalem, meaning place of peace. Mm. 
And those principles start with, basically, it's all good. It's all good. Every cell of our body, every petal of the flower, Someone pointed out to me the other day that just as every snowflake is unique, every single one of these blossoms is unique. Isn't that amazing? It just blows me away. How is it possible that the concept, you know, in, in Native American, we, we have the idea that, you know, there is coyote, capital C, and coyote shows up in different coyotes. right? Flower shows up in all this incredible diversity. And that's what Norva Kapek was trying to get us in touch with when he invented and presented the very first flower communion during World War II when the Nazis were taking over his country of Czechoslovakia. That Unitarian Universalist stood up in the face of Nazi oppression and said, we are all important, all kinds of humanity. There is no one who is not important, no one who is not worthy, no one who is not deserving, no one who is not capable of the fullest expression of humanity. Wow. The Nazis didn't think very well. <laughs> one of the things that divides traditional Unitarian Universalists, the UUA, from the New Thought Unitarian Universalists, is this concept of resurrection. In the UUA, there's a joke. The ministers share this kind of every year. It's the story of the minister who wanders through town and reading all the signboards in all the churches. It's the week before Easter. And the signboards say, Hallelujah, Christ is risen. And they go home and they go, Yippee, the flowers are blooming. thought tradition, the Christ is risen. Not because there is some divine being who somehow, you know, had some ability no human being can have, but because there is within each and every one of us a capacity for life that is far more powerful than anything else. In fact, it is the only power. Now, the first time I encountered this outside of the New Testament was in a book that you actually heard about a few weeks ago, Autobiography of a Yogi. Yeah. I'm going to give you the first part, part one. I entered the ashram room where Master's body, unimaginably lifelike, was sitting in the lotus posture, a picture of health and loveliness a short time before his passing, my guru had been slightly ill with fever, but before the day of his ascension into the infinite, his body had become completely well. No matter how often I looked at his dear form, I could not realize that its life had departed. His skin was smooth and soft. In his face was the beatific, or beatific expression of tranquility. He had consciously relinquished his body at that hour, of mystic summoning. I conducted the solemn rites on March 10th. Sri Yukteswar was buried with the ancient rituals of the Swamis in the garden of his ashram. And then we read over several pages of Yogananda's grief, first of all, that he wasn't present at the passing because he had chosen to do something else. <laughs> But most of all, that this man who had been the center of his life for 30 years was gone. Then, sitting on my bed in the Bombay Hotel at 3 o'clock in the afternoon of June 19, 1936, one week after a vision of Krishna, 
I was roused from my meditation by a beatific light. Before my open and astonished eyes, the whole room was transformed into a strange world, the sunlight transmuted into a supernal splendor. Waves of rapture engulfed me as I beheld the flesh and blood form of Sri Yukteswar. My son, Master spoke tenderly on his face, an angelic, bewitching <coughs> smile. For the first time in my life, I did not kneel at his feet in greeting, but instantly advanced to gather him hungrily in my arms. Moment of moments, the anguish of past months was toll I counted weightless against the torrential bliss now descending. Master mine, beloved of my heart, why did you leave me? I was incoherent with an excess of joy. Why did you let me go? How bitterly have I blamed myself for leaving you. I did not want to interfere with your happy anticipation. And it goes on from there. Wow. Someone outside of the New Testament shows up for his beloved disciple in the same way, with the same kind of love. My next encounter with that concept was in a series of books called The Life and Teaching of the Masters of the Far East. I strongly encourage people to read this book the whole series, it's a set of four. Strongly, strongly encouraging. I'm in volume two. Day after day for two months with the old man as our instructor, we gave our whole attention to a set of tablets which dealt entirely with characters, symbols, and their position, plan, and meaning. One morning in early March, we went to the room in the temple as usual and found the old gentleman lying on the couch, as though asleep. One of our party walked over and placed a hand on his arm to arouse him, then started back and exclaimed, he's not breathing, I believe he's dead. We gathered around the couch and were so absorbed in our own thoughts of death among these people that we did not hear anyone enter. We were aroused from our reverie by a voice saying, good morning. We turned toward the door, and there stood our teacher, Emil. We had supposed he was a thousand miles away, and his sudden appearance had startled us. Before we had time to compose ourselves, he had walked over and was shaking hands all around. In a moment, Emil walked to the couch on which the old man was lying. Placing his hand upon the old man's head, he said, Here we have a dear brother who has departed from this earth, but has not been able to finish his work among us. As one of your poets has said, he has wrapped his mantle about him and is laid down to pleasant dreams. In other words, you have pronounced him dead. Dear friends, kindly think for a moment. To whom did Jesus speak when he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. He was not talking to the outer self the ego, the me, the shell. He was recognizing and praying the infinite self, the inner self, the one, the all-hearing, all-knowing, all-seeing, omnipresence. Here is a dear brother who never relied wholly on that presence, but went on partially on his own strength until he has reached the stage and given up and made the mistake which so many are making the mistake you took upon and looked upon as death. This dear soul has not been able to let go of all doubt and fear, and thus he's relied on his own strength and not been able to finish the work. Should we leave him thus, his body will dissolve and he will be again sent forth to finish his mortal task, which is all but complete. You asked if he can be awakened again to full consciousness. Yes, he can. So, they call in some villagers. Dear reader, words are but a travesty when the mortal attempts to picture the beauty and purity of the light that filled that room. And as that form arose, 
The light seemed to penetrate every object so that nothing cast a shadow, not even the form of our friend or our own bodies. The walls seemed to expand and become transparent until we seemed to be looking into infinite space. The glory of that picture cannot be told. Then we knew that instead of standing in the presence of death, we were standing in the presence of eternal life. Life unspeakably grand, never diminishing, going on and on eternally. What could we mortals do but stand and stare? In the uplift of those few moments, we were carried for a time far beyond our most sanguine imagination of heaven and the beauty of it all. They asked a few questions. One of our friends from the village turned to us and said, I know you are doubting, but won't you understand? This is but one of the emergencies in our lives. And when the emergency does arise, we're able to come up over the emergency. This dear one had not been able in his own strength to quite surmount the divide, as you call it. In fact, as you see it, he had passed on. The soul had left the body behind, and one so enlightened can be helped at the crucial moment so that the soul returns and the body finishes its perfection and then the body can be taken alone. So they buried themselves in their work. They were translating ancient documents, ancient Sanskrit, ancient Tibetan, anything that was in present in this vault. Went on for about three weeks. We had been, excuse me, two weeks. We'd been occupied in this work for about two weeks when we went to the temple one morning and found our friend, who had apparently died and been resurrected without a vestige of old age about him. There was no mistaking him. As we came into the room, he arose and came forward with a hearty greeting and handshake. You can imagine our surprise as we gathered around and began to ask questions. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here are two reasonably supported documents in which people they had worked with and loved dearly went through obviously documented death and were now physically in the room. There's more to human capacity than we have ever acknowledged. A woman decided she needed to do a painting of Jesus. She had a vision in her prayer. She really had a very clear sense of what it was she was going to be painting. She says, that was a restless December. I felt like a racehorse waiting for the gate to open, reassuring myself frequently with inward glances. The vision remained crystal clear and seemed to intimate that a whole new world was being born. It was clearly living, and I beheld it in wonder. The days grew long and tense, although the sense of communion between us was bursting with excitement and the silence which filled the spaces of my anticipation were rich with words yet spoken. <coughs> On January 2nd, I entered my studio with a peace that somehow made for uneasiness, a peace that my body could only recognize as the bristling and imminent presence of destiny. Even though the room smelled of linseed oil and turpentine, it possessed the subtle ambience of a temple. Perhaps my own feelings were displaying the nature of my expectations, or perhaps there was a holiness of spirit which preceded my arrival on that day and had prepared a place for the creation to come. 
Either way, my senses were clear and clean, as if I had been newly born to the world. Everything from the dust on the windowsill to my slightly askew arrangement of brushes to the towering easel before me adorned the moment with details I will never forget. The room was filled with natural sunlight, although it conveyed a sense of another sacred light I'd experienced earlier. It felt as though a thousand eyes were upon me, and I searched the space within and without to discover the watcher. But the silence was only broken by the chant of the meows of my cat right outside the door. <laughs> Gunnar, my beautiful Himalayan cat, wanted to join whatever it was that was happening in the studio. I moved with some reservation toward the door and hesitantly opened it. Somehow I expected to see more than Gunnar but was quite relieved to see that it was only my little blue eyes winking up at me. He darted in quickly, as if to suggest that timing and opportunity were essential to the moment. <laughs> then he scurried over to one of the two white pillows that I used for meditation and prayer. I turned to face the large, pristine canvas mounted on my easel, but it did not yet have the right feeling to begin. You all know what that's like. So I joined Gunnar on the pillows and began my daily practice of acknowledging the master's presence by focusing on the spot of light within until the vision emerged. Today especially, I wanted to study its details as closely as possible because once I switched my focus outwardly toward the canvas, my whole attention would be passed into the creative process. Closed my eyes and looked within. Suddenly, another meow from Gunnar disrupted the intensity of my meditation as a gentle wind swept through the room, brushing my face. The light within, which had been illuminating the vision in my mind, was now shining through my eyelids from without. With a certainty unparalleled in my life, I opened my eyes to behold Jesus, the Christ standing in front of me, towering above my seated position. With slow and careful reverence, I arose, took my place in the painting chair, and began drawing on the canvas. The problem of how I could behold the vision within and the canvas without had been solved. <laughs> it took two or three days, excuse me, day by day, it was more than a vision. He was there, and we would become a team for creating the painting. It took two or three days to complete the drawing, so I didn't start painting till the following week. After applying the first layer of paint, I expected to be taking some time off, such as the way it is with oil paint, which has a lengthy drying time. That is one of the time-consuming aspects of the medium. Nevertheless, it is important to wait. The next morning, I entered the studio to check on the canvas, and everything was dry. Absolutely everything. I was shocked. I never used dryers or thinners because the constitution and longevity of the paint could be compromised. So how was this happening? It was a mystery to me, but the fact was, the paint always dried within hours for the duration of this project. Except for Sundays, the painting unfolded without interruption. The timing of everything was flawless, flawless, and all my needs were provided. A daily occurrence of miracles in the midst of ordinary procedures eventually allowed me to develop a new pattern of expectation about the possibilities of life. So the rest of this book is what he was telling her while she was painting. 1995, in Texas. <sighs> what is it that humanity is capable of? What is it that life and love in us, through us, and as us can bring forth for us and for the people around us? That is the question that Easter gives us. And these are some of the answers 
that these people's life experiences documented in the interesting ways offer. I have walked two paths of Unitarian Universalism. And in this congregation, I have felt the paths come together. And I give you thanks that this is so. I was going to read something else, but I'm not going <laughs> to. It's a piece of my version of how Mary Magdalene experienced the Jesus experience. But it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> so I will do that another time. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing the possibility that these two unfoldings of the incredible ideas that Ralph Waldo Emerson set down on paper 150 years ago are actually mergeable in organized community fellowship of spirituality. Thank you. And now I'd like to take you through my version of the flower communion. But it's going to require a little effort on your part. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to sing the Alleluia. Alleluia means praise to Yah, who is the feminine face of the divine, by the way. <laughs> Alleluia. Okay? And there is a wonderful, wonderful thing that whenever it was played on the radio from the 1970s when it began to be emerge, emerge in our culture well into the current decade, people call in and say, what was that incredible piece of music? We know it as Paco Bell's Canon in D. And I was working with Jean Houston a few dozen years ago. And she had this marvelous thing that she did, and I, I've adopted it for our programming. We are going to sing Paco Bell's Canon in D while we go through the Flower Communion. And some of you may recall that we did something like this last year. So we're going to start with the low voices. And if you're, you're the, the ones, you're the cello that goes over and over. Alleluia, Alleluia. We're going to do that over. Alleluia. Low voices. <laughs> yeah. Alleluia. High voices don't go there. Alleluia. Alleluia. Good. Now there's a medium voice. Alleluia. Let's do those two together. There's a high part too. Low voices first. Oh, 